in pit lane is proudly brought to you by Dino Tech by Dino Dynamics. For your nearest workshop, visit our website. And with the support of the Ramada Resort, Phillip Island. Throughout the 1960s and into the mid-70s was a classic era of big banger sports cars. Competing in events like the Le Mans 24 Hours and the North American Can-Am series, these purpose-built sports races were, for a short time, very much considered a threat to the popularity of Formula One. In 2013, the Victorian Historic Racing Register invited a field of these cars to race at the annual Phillip Island Classic Festival of Motorsport. Widely regarded as one of the premier events of its kind in the world, the Phillip Island Classic attracts competitors and hardcore race fans from all over Australia and from across the globe. For race fans of a certain age, and I'm certainly one of them, the chance to see some of these remarkable machines in the flesh was just too good an opportunity to pass up. To see and hear cars like the Le Mans winning Matra 670B was a journey into a past that I never actually experienced. I have vivid memories of the famous Autosport cover featuring the car's win at the 1973 Le Mans with the all-French pairing of Henri Pescarolo and Gerard Larousse. All up the 670 won three times at Le Mans in 1972, 73 and 74. Its 3-litre V12 engine, as famous for its sweet but piercing exhaust note as it was for its reliability and performance. The Matra wasn't the only Le Mans winner at Phillip Island. The Porsche Museum was once again on hand to display two classic sports races of a different era, including this 936, the winner of the 1981 French Classic. Well, the car to my right here is the Jules uh, 936 from 1981, and it's an interesting story about this car, because originally it raced in 76 and 77, and it was retired for into the museum, in the Porsche Museum. And then uh, Peter Schultz, the then boss of Porsche, decided we need a car to race in 81. We must win Le Mans in 81. So they, all they have is this car at the museum. So they take this car out of the museum and put the new generation water-cooled flat six engine in and some bodywork modifications and Ix and Bell have a good run with this car and uh, win the event for Porsche, 14 lap in front. So it, it, it works good, good for this old car, works good. And it was the last of the uh, Group 6 regulation. Uh, so then in 82 was the group, new Group C car, which they built a new car, no, uh, 956. So this old car works well with the new engine and great drivers. and. A victory, another victory for Porsche. The interesting thing about this car and, and the Porsches in general at that time is that they were still space frame. They, they really were the last hangouts. Obviously worked because they were enormously successful. That's correct, yeah. This is the old technology frame, the um, space frame, the aluminium tube, all handmade, of course. Uh, and then with the new regulation in Group C, they uh, make the monocoque, the aluminium monocoque, all an aerodynamic, very aerodynamic car, so all new thinking. So this is the last of the older thinking, older technology, but it works well. Tell us a bit about the engine. Uh, the engine originally was developed for the Indy car uh, on a methanol engine, and then the factory decide they need a new engine for the Moby Dick in 78, and they bring this engine with uh, four valve, twin overhead cam, water-cooled heads and air-cooled cylinders and they adapt it for petrol to run in Moby Dick and then this engine is a, a progression 
for the 936. So they have this engine ready for for uh, 956. So, but the full car is not ready. So they ha take this engine and put it in the 936, and it, it works well. Now the car that's alongside of it here today is probably is the last of the. Uh, prototype Porsches until we see next year of course that's the LMP2 car the Spider tell us about that well this uh, was the first generation and it's starting up yeah that's right this is the first generation of the LMP2 car so uh, yeah, it's a little bit noisy uh, but uh, we take some photos of this and you can see uh, see where the technology from this car all carbon fibre, so different thinking. The North American K&M series of the late 1960s and early 70s is regarded by many as the pinnacle of sports car racing. Sure there were rules, but they were very flexible and they allowed some of the fastest and still most powerful circuit racing cars ever built. Phillip Island was a rare chance to see these amazing cars outside of the USA. The man who bought them here was Scott Dernick. Well, the Can-Am was probably the most wildly American series because it was a no-limits series. The rules were you had to have four wheels, you have it had an engine that burned liquid fuel, and that was about it. You couldn't have movable aerodynamic devices. So the engines just got exponentially bigger. I mean, nine liters is a pretty big engine. Uh, the tires are 19 inches wide on the rear. The cars uh, have an incredible amount of power and torque. And you know the motto of the the series they used to have in the day was that too much was barely enough. Uh. You mentioned the McLeagle that we're standing in front of at the moment. Tell us about that. I mean, very famous driver in Dan Gurney, and he never sort of left well enough alone. He, and as you say, he's modified this specifically. What are the features of this car? Well, when they got the the McLaren, uh, it started out life as a regular McLaren M6, and they thought they could improve upon it. So. The first thing you do with a race car is make it lighter. So they made lighter weight bodywork. They made a number of titanium components. That beautifully fabricated exhaust, the sand bent titanium tubing, which in 1968 was pretty exotic. Um, making the car lighter worked very well for them. So emboldened by that, they changed the shape of the front bodywork, and that worked a little bit better too. After that, most of the modifications they did made the car slower. And at the end of the day, if you talk to people who worked on the car in period, the biggest takeaway they had from the whole experiment was that Bruce McLaren was a lot more clever than they thought. When you think of classic Italian sports cars, you think of Ferrari. But Ferrari isn't the only great Italian mark in international sports car racing, far from it. Alfa Romeo has a long and proud history of great sports cars at Le Mans. Joe Nastasi is an Alfa Romeo lover from the United States and he brought two stunning examples to Phillip Island. My name is Joe Nastasi. I am uh, from New York, Italian, and I've been collecting this Alfa Romeo for a long time, sometime back in 1985. I have a lot of those. We enjoy driving, representing the Alfa Romeo colors. And uh, I was invited here in uh, Australia. Very nice, very kind people. We enjoy the track and the weather. And you know, just uh, for the sport, you know. Tell us about the cars you brought out. The cars I brought out were, uh, this one here is a 12-cylinder, a 1975 World Championship N77, uh, sponsored by Fenner Tonic. I purchased the car originally from Auto Delta in 1984. And I always been restored to driving, enjoying. Beautiful car, easy to drive, lots of power, just old. <laughs> Sadly, Joe's weekend didn't turn out quite as he had hoped, as the T33 SC12 had engine problems and did too few laps for anyone's liking. In the late 1970s, the Sports Car Club of America came up with a bold plan to try and revive the golden days of the Can-Am series. The new era Can-Am cars were essentially rebodied Formula 5000s. The concept never really took off, despite featuring some of the biggest names in the sport and some pretty wild looking cars, like the Lola T332 based Spider of New South Wales driver Andrew Kluver. This, uh, this was actually a car that was one of three, um, 332, in this case CS, which is the Chaparral based uh, chassis. 
um, which was bought by Paul Newman and uh, Bill Freeman and they set up in Santa Barbara, a little garage, an old cast station, and they built about three of these cars. Uh, they're called spider cars. To our knowledge, this is the only one that still exists in the world. And this is, as you can see, the Keki Rosberg car, um, which Keki was pretty notorious in terms of the way he drove it. And there's some great YouTube footage of it, uh, but the car itself um, has been restored. Um, we had an accident, burnt to the ground last year. We have since rebuilt it and it's in pristine condition. Um, but the car as it is has probably only seen racing in the last 18 months uh, from the ground up restoration that we did on it. So one of the problems of the K&M single seat K&M era is of course that many of them started their lives as actual Formula 5000s. The fact that this has got the other, another chassis underneath, does that make it integral that it's going to stay like this and not be broken up for a 5000? Well this one won't be broken up um, and the reason it won't be broken up as I said I believe this is the only spider in the world. I, I stand corrected but I have done some pretty intensive searches. Um, this car is also known as the John Corn car which means it's, um, it's got pedigree, um, so I can run it either way, but I wouldn't change it back. Um, it's just the way the car is. It's also been driven by uh, Bobby Rahal, uh, Elliot Forbes Robinson, um, and as I said, Keki Rosberg, to I think he actually won the world championship in it in 78. Australia had its own era of big banger sports cars, names like Matic, Elfin and Renmax. This Renmax BN6 had been in the Gibson family for many years. Paul Gibson raced the car in the 1970s. This weekend at Phillip Island, his son Michael was given the chance to continue the family tradition. It's a real honour, you know, especially being in the family for so long and, uh, you know, growing up around this car and uh, getting the opportunity to drive it. It's just like a, a childhood dream come true. And then uh, to go on to next week and drive it at the Grand Prix is even a, a bigger buzz, you know, so it's, it's really good. So for people who don't know the history of the Gibson family, especially around the Benalla area, I mean, one of the most famous racing families in Australia, really. Uh, tell us the history of the family and also in particular how it relates to this car. Yep. Um, yeah, well, it started with my grandfather, Hoot Gibson, and then uh, my uncle Bevan, who was killed at Bathurst and then uh, tragically, and then... Um, my dad started racing in a Lotus 23 and then after that purchased this car and um, he raced it for a few years, then my Uncle Grant and then my Uncle Carl and then uh, now I've, uh, I've finally got the opportunity to drive it so um, yeah it's just great. Yeah. So the car was obviously around a lot longer before you were, I mean tell us a bit about the history of it, what sort of car is it, when, when was it originally built? Yeah it, it was built by Bob Britton, uh, it's a uh, Renmax sports car with a 3 litre Repco Rab in it um, Dad and Grant uh, raced it in the uh, Group A Sports Car Championship in the uh, mid-70s and uh, backed by Shell Sport um, back in the day and um, yeah, I mean, they had a lot of success in it. Uh, the New South Wales Tourist Trophy and a lot of rap, lap records uh, through Victoria and uh, New South Wales, so yeah, a lot of history. Australian race engineer Barry Locke is responsible for some of the fastest sports cars ever seen in Australia. Cars like Pap Romano's Kaditcha and the ex-Kevin Bartlett Di Tommaso, which was also seen at the island. But for years he was part of the all-conquering McLaren k and juggernaut. McLaren dominated k and racing. Only the might of Porsche could end one of the most dominant streaks in the history of world motorsport. Locke is still working on classic McLarens and still making them go fast. Um, my role was uh, detail engineering and uh, at that stage Gordon Coppock was the uh, chief engineer um, responsible for all aspects of design and so on. And uh, that was just after Robin Hurd who was also very successful at McLarens and uh, put, uh, put all the groundwork in place for these sort of motor cars. So what's it like working on this car again? Oh, it's uh, absolutely fantastic. I, uh, I, I love the, uh, the, the motor cars, the sports cars are just great. Um, in fact, at that stage, the, uh, as I say, the whole, the, really the focus was upon the sports cars and of course the results show that as well. But um, it's, uh, it's just great to be involved yet again. Yeah. This particular motor car is uh, one of the Trojan built motor cars. Trojan built the customer cars uh, to our specs that were the previous year's works cars. And uh, this particular car is probably the most original here in pit lane today. Uh, it, uh, it uses um, 
absolutely identical components to the customer car at that time and it was of course one of the most successful customer cars at the time as well. It's a big lump of engine in the back, we sort of ooh and ah about the Formula 5000 and but tell us about, this is a bit bigger than a 5 litre I believe. Well yes it is, um, when we uh, were looking for more horsepower as that was part of the game at the stage of course. Um, Reynolds came to the assistance with their 8 litre aluminium blocks and uh, this is um, a, uh, basically it's the Reynolds 8 litre aluminium block. This one's 800 horsepower and um, well obviously very effective. The fine weather, the great racing and the all round atmosphere of the Island Classic make the meeting a must see on the bucket list of any hardcore race fan. 2014 will be the event's silver anniversary. One wonders how they'll celebrate it. Silver, eh? Hmm. Silver.